The War of the Worlds, Chapter 3, on Horsell Common. I found a little crowd of perhaps twenty people surrounding the huge hole in which the cylinder lay. I have already described the appearance of that colossal bulk embedded in the ground. The turf and gravel about it seemed charred, as if by a sudden explosion. No doubt its impact had caused a flash of fire. Henderson and Ogilvy were not there. I think they perceived that nothing was to be done for the present, and had gone away to breakfast at Henderson's house. There were four or five boys sitting at the edge of the pit, with their feet dangling, and amusing themselves, until I stopped them, by throwing stones at the giant mass. After I'd spoken to them about it, they began playing at touch, in and out of the group of bystanders. Among these were a group of cyclists, a jobbing gardener I employed sometimes, a girl carrying a baby, Greg the butcher, and his little boy, and two or three loafers and golf caddies who were accustomed to hang about by the railway station. There was very little talking. Few of the common people in England had anything but the vaguest astronomical ideas in those days. Most of them were staring quietly at the big table-like end of the cylinder, which was still as Ogilvy and Henderson had left it. I fancy the popular expectation of a heap of charred corpses was disappointed at this inanimate bulk. Some went away while I was there, and other people came. I clambered into the pit, and fancied I heard a faint movement under my feet. The top had certainly ceased to rotate. It was only when I got close to it that the strangeness of this object was at all evident to me. At the first glance, it was really no more exciting than an overturned carriage or a tree blown across the road. Not so much so, indeed. It looked like a rusty gas float. It required a certain amount of scientific education to perceive that the grey scale of the thing was no common oxide, that the yellowish-white metal that gleamed in the crack between the lid and the cylinder had an unfamiliar hue. Extraterrestrial had no meaning for most of the onlookers. At that time it was quite clear in my own mind that the thing had come from the planet Mars, but I judged it improbable that it contained any living creature. I thought the unscrewing might be automatic. In spite of Ogilvy, I still believed that there were men in Mars. My mind ran fancifully on the possibilities of its containing manuscript, on the difficulties in translation that might arise, whether we should find coins and models in it, and so forth. Yet it was too large for assurance on this idea. I felt an impatience to see it opened. About eleven, as nothing seemed happening, I walked back, full of such thought, to my home in Maybury. I found it difficult to get to work upon my abstract investigations. In the afternoon the appearance of the common had altered very much. The early editions of the evening papers had startled London with enormous headlines. A message received from Mars, remarkable story from Woking, and so forth. In addition, Ogilvy's wire to the astronomical exchange had roused every observatory in the three kingdoms. There were half a dozen flies or more from the Woking station standing in the road by the sand pits, a basket chaise from Shobham, and a rather lordly carriage. Besides that, there was quite a heap of bicycles. In addition, a large number of people must have walked, in spite of the heat of the day, from Woking and Chertsey, so that there was altogether quite a considerable crowd, one or two gaily dressed ladies among the others. It was glaringly hot, not a cloud in the sky, nor a breath of wind, and the only shadow was that of a few scattered pine trees. The burning heather had been extinguished, but the level ground towards Ottershaw was blackened as far as one could see, and still giving off vertical streamers of smoke. An enterprising sweetstuff dealer in the Chobham Road had sent up his son with a barrow load of green apples and ginger beer. Going to the edge of the pit, 
I found it occupied by a group of about half a dozen men, Henderson, Ogilvy, and a tall, fair-haired man that I afterwards learned was Stent, the Astronomer Royal, with several workmen wielding spades and pickaxes. Stent was giving directions in a clear, high-pitched voice. He was standing on the cylinder, which was now evidently much cooler. His face was crimson and streaming with perspiration, and something seemed to have irritated him. A large portion of the cylinder had been uncovered, though its lower end was still embedded. As soon as Ogilvy saw me among the staring crowd on the edge of the pit, he called me to come down, and asked if I would mind going over to see Lord Hilton, the Lord of the Manor. The growing crowd, he said, was becoming a serious impediment to their excavations, especially the boys. They wanted a light railing put up, and help to keep people back. He told me that a faint stirring was occasionally still audible within the case, but that the workmen had failed to unscrew the top, as it afforded no grip to them. The case appeared to be enormously thick, and it was possible that the faint sounds we heard represented a noisy tumult within the interior. I was very glad to do as he asked, and so become one of the privileged spectators within the contemplated enclosure. I failed to find Lord Hilton at his house, but I was told he was expected from London by six o'clock train from Waterloo, and as it was then about quarter past five, I went home, had some tea, and walked up to the station to waylay him. Chapter 4 The Cylinder Opens When I returned to the common, the sun was setting. Scattered groups were hurrying from the direction of Woking, and one or two persons were returning. The crowd about the pit had increased, and stood out black against the lemon yellow of the sky. A couple of hundred people, perhaps. There were raised voices, and some sort of struggle appeared to be going on about the pit. Strange imaginings passed through my mind. As I drew nearer, I heard Stent's voice. Keep back! Keep back! A boy came running towards me. It's a moving, he said to me as he passed. A screwing and a screwing out. I don't like it. I'm going home, I am. I went on to the crowd. There were really, I should think, two or three hundred people elbowing and jostling one another. The one or two ladies there being by no means the least active. It's fallen in the pit, cried someone. Keep back, said several. The crowd swayed a little, and I elbowed my way through. Everyone seemed greatly excited. I heard a peculiar humming sound from the pit. I say, said Ogilvy, keep those idiots back. We don't know what's in the confounded thing, you know. I saw a young man, a shop assistant in Woking, I believe he was, standing on the cylinder and trying to scramble out of the hole again. The crowd had pushed him in. The end of the cylinder was being screwed out from within. Nearly two feet of shining screw projected. Somebody blundered against me, and I narrowly missed being pitched into the top of the screw. I turned, and as I did so, the screw must have come out, for the lid of the cylinder fell upon the gravel with a ringing concussion. I stuck my elbow into the person behind me, and turned my head towards the thing again. For a moment that circular cavity seemed perfectly black. I had the sunset in my eyes. I think everyone expected to see a man emerge, possibly something a little unlike us terrestrial men, but in all essentials a man. I know I did, but looking I presently saw something stirring within the shadow, greyish billowy movements, one above another, and then two luminous discs like eyes, and something or but then something resembling a little grey snake, about the thickness of a walking stick, coiled up out of the writhing middle, and wriggled in the air towards me. And then another. A sudden chill came over me. There was a loud shriek from a woman behind. I half turned, keeping my eyes fixed upon the cylinder, still, from which other tentacles were now projecting, and began pushing my way back from the edge of the pit. 
I saw astonishment giving place to horror in the faces of the people around me. I heard inarticulate exclamations on all sides. There was a general movement backwards. I saw the shopman struggling still on the edge of the pit. I found myself alone and saw the people on the other side of the pit running off, stent among them. I looked again at the cylinder and ungovernable terror gripped me. I stood petrified and staring. A big, greyish, rounded bulk, the size perhaps of a bear, was rising slowly and painfully out of the cylinder. As it bulged up and caught the light, it glistened like wet leather. Two large, dark-coloured eyes were regarding me steadfastly. The mass that framed them, the head of the thing, was rounded and had, one might say, a face. There was a mouth under the eyes, a lipless brim of which quivered and panted and dropped saliva. The whole creature heaved and pulsated convulsively. A lank, tentacular appendage gripped the edge of the cylinder. Another swayed in the air. Those who have never seen a living Martian can scarcely imagine the strange horror of its appearance. The peculiar V-shaped mouth with its pointed upper lip, the absence of brow ridges, the absence of a chin beneath the wedge-like lower lip, the incessant quivering of this mouth, the gorgon groups of tentacles, the tumultuous breathing of the lungs in a strange atmosphere, the evident heaviness and painfulness of movement due to the greater gravitational energy of the earth, above all, the extraordinary intensity of the immense eyes, were at once vital, intense, inhuman, crippled and monstrous. There was something fungoid in the oily brown skin, something in the clumsy deliberation of the tedious movements unspeakably nasty. Even at this first encounter, this first glimpse, I was overcome with disgust and dread. Suddenly the monster vanished. It had toppled over the brim of the cylinder and fallen into the pit, with a thud, like a fall of a great mass of leather. I heard it give a peculiar thick cry, and forthwith another of these tentacles appeared darkly in the deep shadow of the aperture. I turned, and, running madly, made for the first group of trees, perhaps a hundred yards away. But I ran slantingly and stumbling, for I could not avert my face from these things. There, among some young pine trees and furzy bushes, I stopped, panting, and waited further developments. The common around the sandpits was dotted with people, standing, like myself, in half-fascinated terror, staring at these creatures, or rather at the heaped gravel at the edge of the pit in which they lay. And then, with renewed horror, I saw a round, black object bobbing up and down on the edge of the pit. It was the head of the shopman who'd fallen in, but showing as a little black object against the hot western sun. Now he got his shoulder and knee up, and again he seemed to slip back only till his head was visible. Suddenly he vanished, and I could have fancied a faint shriek had reached me. I had a momentary impulse to go back and help him that my fears overruled. Everything was then quite invisible, hidden by the deep pit and the heap of sand that the fall of the cylinder had made. Anyone coming along the road from Chobham or Woking would have been amazed at the sight. A dwindling multitude of perhaps a hundred people or more standing in a great irregular circle, in ditches, behind bushes, behind gates and hedges, saying little to one another, and that in short excited shouts and staring staring hard at a few heaps of sand. The barrow of ginger beer stood, a queer derelict, black against the burning sky, and in the sandpits was a row of deserted vehicles, with their horses feeding out of nosebags or pawing the ground.